In this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, we're going to follow up on something that we discovered was a big part of our previous study. In our previous episode, the group was in John chapter 5, and the story surrounding Jesus miraculously healing a man who hadn't been able to walk for 38 years. It happened by the pool of Bethesda, and we called it By the Pool. That was the title of that episode. And one thing we discovered was a major factor in that miracle Jesus performed was the day on which he did it. That day was the Sabbath, and that was a big deal. And so this week, we're going to explore the question, does Sabbath still matter? We're going to consider the idea of Sabbath and talk through just some different passages of Scripture where we see the idea of Sabbath show up. And we're going to ask the question, does it even apply to us anymore as New Testament, New Covenant people? Or was the Sabbath a part of just the Old Testament? You know, I think that's going to be an interesting question because really when you look at the New Testament, it speaks pretty negatively about Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the yeah. religious leaders, they were after Jesus all the time for oh, yeah. not keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah, in some ways, and we're going to talk about this, you could say that's why he ended up being killed. Is yeah. because of the way that he acted on the Sabbath in ways that they did not agree with. Yeah, it was a tough question then, and in a lot of ways, a tough question today. Does Sabbath still matter? Let's explore that in this edition of the Discover the Word podcast. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from our Daily Bread Ministries. I'm Brian Hedding, and you know, I remember 20 years ago, we were studying through the Ten Commandments here on Discover the Word. And when we came to the fourth command about the Sabbath, I think it created more comments, and I mean strong feelings expressed than about any other subject I can recall. It was a hot button question in Jesus' day, and it's still a hot button question among people who take their faith and the scriptures seriously today. Does Sabbath still matter? Well, Daniel Ryan Day is leading these conversations, and at the table with him are Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, and Bill Crowder. And Daniel says, first of all, he'd like to consider some passages about the intention and heart behind the Sabbath. And then toward the end of the hour, consider whether or not, and if so, how it still applies to us today. So here we go with another session of studying the Bible together on Discover the Word. When was the last time that you completed a big project? So it could be around the house, it could be at work. What did you do afterwards, after you finished? Well, at our house, whenever I finish a project, we celebrate by going out to eat. (laughs) Okay, Uh, that's good. (laughs) And uh, whether it's finishing a book project or something here in the house, we just go get a nice dinner somewhere. Yeah, that's the way projects ramped up in my mind too, or writing projects, you know, whether it's uh, deadlines I have to meet. And I kind of don't do anything. I just try to have a little bit of space in between them, if mm. that makes any sense. That's probably healthy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, what comes to mind is fall cleanup of the leaves. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, that drags on for weeks. <laughs> and, uh, All the leaves. and yeah, yeah, the leaves and, you know, collecting them and tarping them and taking them to the leaf dump and getting rid of them and then and then watching the wind come from the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I recently had to redo a floor in our house because we had some flooding and it was uh, the type of floor that when water gets on it, it soaks up water and then warps. <laughs> and oh, so I had to... Wonderful. Yeah, yeah uh, it, was, it was a lot of work to tear out, to replace the floor. But after... I finished it. I remember just sitting down on it because the room's empty and there's this new floor there and just kind of enjoying looking at the completed project. It felt good. To, and I feel actually the same way with leaves, Mart, when I do get all the leaves cleaned up and you're like, wow, the, the grass looks good. Or even snow blowing, you know, when you finish the driveway and you're like, yeah. man, that looks nice. Uh, and so just a, a moment of enjoyment. I wish I could say I always do that, <laughs> but uh, a lot of times I don't take time to enjoy a finished project. Instead, oftentimes I don't put the space, like Elisa mentioned, between projects and end up jumping into the 
next one right away. Yeah, and yeah. I've got to bring up one that I probably everybody's thinking of is um, when you clean the house. Yeah. And then five minutes later, the dog comes in with mud or mm -hmm. when you make Thanksgiving dinner. And I'm serious, 20 minutes and it's just, you know, dregs on the table. And it was so beautiful <laughs> 20 <laughs> minutes before. And you spend days getting ready for it. Yeah, there are a lot of those moments. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's not really the opportunity to take a space, but yeah. you forget to. Yeah. One of my pet peeves is when I'm doing the dishes and I finally am finishing that last one and then someone adds one more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> find somewhere. Well, this week we're going to consider the idea of Sabbath and talk through just some different passages of Scripture where we see the idea of Sabbath show up. And we're going to ask the question, does it even apply to us anymore as New Testament, New Covenant people? Or was the Sabbath a part of just the Old Testament? You know, I think that's going to be an interesting question because really when you look at the New Testament, it speaks pretty negatively about Sabbath. Yeah. yeah, especially when you get into Galatians and some of the texts where Paul's having trouble with Judaizers who are trying to impose Moses' law on top of the Christian community, it is an interesting challenge. Yeah, and the yeah. religious leaders, they were after Jesus all the time for oh, yeah. not keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah, in some ways, and we're going to talk about this, you could say that's why he ended up being killed. Yeah. Is because of the way that he acted on the Sabbath in ways that they did not agree with. And we've talked about it on the program before, Daniel, but it seems when you read the Gospels, that he did so many of his works on the Sabbath day mm -hmm. that you almost get the feeling that he was intentionally doing that just <laughs> to kind of tweak the Pharisees a little bit. Yeah, poke yeah. in the eye. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think we have kind of a, a wonky view that Sabbath was somehow connected to our sinfulness and fallenness. You know, mm -hmm. it's because we fell and broke that then we had to have the Sabbath. And now that Jesus has come, we don't need it anymore. So I think we've got some very interesting cultural and just passed down ideas about it mm -hmm. that we need to look at. Yeah, and that would be a good place to start. Was Sabbath something that was offered after the fall or before the fall? Before you get into it, Daniel, you're using the word Sabbath. And this comment may kind of give you a hint as to where my leaning is. But when you're using the word Sabbath, are you using it as the principle of rest or honoring the Sabbath day itself? Thank you for asking that question, Bill. And I pray that you will bring that tension with you into each of our conversations. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not ignoring you. But if you still have that question after about three conversations, let me know okay. and we'll talk through it. I want to start by reading Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 3, if somebody could read that for us. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Yeah, so Bill, where is the word Sabbath in verse 2? Rested? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So... The word rested in this passage is the word Shabbat, yeah. which hmm. can refer to resting. Uh, specifically, it means to cease or to stop, because there is another word in Hebrew for like resting to take a nap, but it means to cease or to stop something. And so, yeah, here in the very beginning of Genesis, uh, before chapter three, where the fall is, the word that we end up with Sabbath, the word Shabbat, shows up, and it's God resting from the work that he had done. And are you going to explain to us why God, the all-powerful one, mm -hmm. the, the almighty? The one who never sleeps or slumbers. That's one of yeah. my questions, Mark. Why would God need to rest? <laughs> no, no, right? no, no. I got the question yeah. first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there, there's some implications there, right? Like, was God exhausted? Did he yeah. wear himself out after creating? I'm really struck by the fact that it's th repeated three times that he rested from the yeah. work. He rested from the work. He rested from the work he had done in creation. So it's like he rested from something specific, yeah. a specific kind of activity. Mm -hmm. The way I've always heard it described, and you can correct me, Daniel, because you've done all the study on this, but the way I've always heard it is that there's a difference between the rest of fatigue and the rest of fulfillment. Hmm. And that's kind of that space you were talking about, Elisa, yeah. after a project where 
you cease and rest because something's been completed mm. as opposed to I'm just worn out from this project. There's a difference. I've never Does heard that, that make before. Any sense? That's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a helpful picture here because we started the conversation talking about finishing a big project. And what I hope that we kind of see as we consider God finishing a big project and then resting I wonder if he's doing kind of what I did. Now I was also tired when I sat on the floor and enjoyed it, <laughs> seeing mm -hmm. the fruit of that work. But I almost get a sense here that what God's doing is he's delighting in his creation. And if you think about the context of this passage, what has God said about each day that he created? That they were good. Yeah. Each day was good. Good, good, good. And then at the very mm -hmm. end, it's very good. Mm -hmm. And then even here in this Section verse two says, God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, that's a kind of a fancy word. I don't know if it's hallowed or hallowed uh, it, but what does that mean to hallow something or to bless something? I think we've discussed this in other conversations. It's to honor, right? To, to um, speak good over it. Yeah. Blessing is a pronouncement of good, which God has already done many times that this is good, 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 very good. A blessing is a pronouncement of favor on something. Someone or something that is blessed by God is seen as having God's eye on it, that God's noticed it. So how does that maybe help us as we think about, Mart, your question about was God exhausted or was there maybe something else going on here? And there had to be something going on, something yeah. else. I, yeah. I, you used the word delight, Daniel, a minute ago when you were talking about it, and I love that, to delight in it. Another word that comes to my mind when you put these words of blessing and hallowed together is the word appreciate. Yeah. You know, when you sit back and you just look at it, and you go, oh, you just appreciate it. And, and I don't really know what the the root of that word is, but I, the sense of it is to go, wow, <laughs> just kind of mm -hmm. wow, you know, which I mm -hmm. think is the translation of what Adam said after woman was created, right? Wow, yeah. <laughs> kind of an appreciation. Yeah, for sure. And there's like a, a sense here in which God is setting apart this seventh day as something different than the other six days. He's setting it apart as special. And, and honestly, the word holy or uh, sacred or some of those fancy churchy words that we use, it's really all it means is just to set apart something as special. Mm -hmm. And that's what God's doing. He's setting apart this seventh day as something different from the other six days. And part of the difference is he's ceased, he's Shabbated <laughs> <laughs> the work that he was doing. And he's doing a different kind of work, even just a resting, delighting and enjoying what he's created. And I, I think we kind of see that in the repetition of the word good, 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 very good. There's like a sense in which God is pausing at the end of a lot of hard work and he's enjoying the fruit of his labor. And that's maybe the last thing that I wanted to point out the way the word rested is used here, or the word Shabbat. As Bill was asking his question earlier, we often think of Sabbath as a noun like a day, right? It's a Sabbath day. But here it's almost being used as a verb, right? Like God is Shabbating, he's resting. And so I, I want us to carry that with us too as we keep going through these conversations. And so just to end this conversation, before the fall, we have this idea of Shabbating, this idea of resting. And I think what God's doing is delighting and enjoying the work that he has created. And I wonder if we're invited to do the same. Uh, and so let's take that tension with us as we go through the rest of the series. Is it difficult for you to take a day off? It used to be. There are a number of years where, especially when you're a pastor in smaller churches and so much keeps landing on your desk, you just kind of feel like, yeah. I can't afford to take a day off. Mm -hmm. Something's going to happen and I've got to be there. But then as I got older, I found that the church had been around a long time before I showed up and it'd probably do just fine after I was gone. Yeah. <laughs> and Daniel, when you say take a day off, off of what? I'm thinking of work, but I think that question could be flexed to cover a lot of things because taking a day off from being with your family, if you uh -huh. need some space or taking a day off from being at church because you've been serving for a long season and need a break or something like that. I'm just curious if, 
it's easy or difficult for you to recognize in yourself that you need a break and then to take the space to do it. On that note, many of us work and have families. And so when I think take a day off, I think a day off from work. But what I discover is that when I take a day off from work, it becomes consumed with family. And so it's like, yeah, it's really difficult for me to take a day off because I go straight to what I want to do in relationships, even with friends too, that I don't do because I'm working. So I just feel in my quote off time with other really wonderful things, but they're still on times. Yeah, what came to my mind is just our lives tend to fill up, I think, with routines Mm -hmm. and with the effort that comes with those routines Mm -hmm. and maybe just a break, period, from from the regular routines of our life might have something to do with what we're talking about. Maybe that's why vacations are so different, although you Mm -hmm. still have to come back to work and that's hard, but you do interrupt the routine. Yeah, Yeah. and vacations sometimes with little kids are just, putting yourself in a more difficult place to parent. <laughs> no, no kidding. For me, I, I struggle especially to take off time from work. I don't struggle to request paid time off, take a vacation day. What I struggle to do is to not check email or my phone or things like that while I'm on my day off. Mm-hmm. And I can only imagine for the others around the table that have been around a little longer than I have and are used to a time when there were no cell phones, mm. that had to have been nice in some ways <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because my whole career has been with everyone having a cell phone in your pocket, which means your email is always there which means people can contact you if they have a question just about any time. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for me to just like shut that off and not pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And the times that I do do a better job of shutting it off, I always feel like I need to like earn it or make up for the fact that Mm -hmm. I took time off as well, which I don't think is healthy, but that's where I am. But that's also one of the realities you know going into a vacation is you've got to do a lot of extra stuff because you're going to be gone. And you know that when you get back, there's going to be a lot of catching up to do. And so there is pressure on both ends of it. Yeah, vacation sometimes means more work on the front end and more work on the back end. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Haven't our lives, though, changed with the coming of the laptop? And we talk about the cell phone now. Mm -hmm. But even the introduction of the laptop, for a lot of us, we used to do the word just at the office. Mm. Yeah. But when the laptop came along, then all of a sudden it was there on the weekends. Mm-hmm. I and mean, this is before cell phones and all. Yeah. And right. that was the issue in my house. My wife would see me working on a laptop on the weekend. It, it was hard for me to let go of. Uh-huh. Yeah. And another reality is we live in a global world now where mm-hmm. it's, you know, we used to just be so regional and just our time zone. And now, especially, you know, when you're in a global ministry, the world is at your yeah. fingertips and it's not time off in other time zones. It's yeah. time on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's, yeah, it's really tricky. I feel the looking back, I didn't do a good job at putting away the laptop or the phone. And I think it really did intrude on my family relationships. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is such a helpful way to set up where we're going to continue in this conversation on Sabbath and whether it still matters or not, which again is kind of the question we're bringing with us into each conversation is if it even applies to us anymore or not. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to get there yet. We're going to have to hold off a little bit longer. But I want to jump into a passage in Exodus chapter 16, where we see Sabbath go from a verb, as we talked about in our last conversation of Shabbating to more of an instituted noun, a thing to do or a thing to follow. And so this is in Exodus 16. Where are we in the story of the Exodus by the time we get to chapter 16? Well, you really have to start with the end of Genesis, I think, because at the end of Genesis, we see Joseph, who has now been raised to a high position of authority in Egypt. Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob or Israel. And now in this high position, he can provide for his family. So he brings his family to stay in Egypt and to be cared for. And 400 years pass. And during that 400 years, the people of Israel have grown to this huge multitude of people. Mm -hmm. And they are now enslaved because the writer says there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. He didn't regard Joseph's contributions because they were hundreds of years ago. And he enslaves the people, and Moses is born. He's driven out of the country of Egypt because he 
kills a man, and God meets Moses and calls him to go and be his instrument to bring the people out of that slavery and into a living relationship with God. And I'll let somebody else pick up the story at that point. So the process of the rescue included... 10 plagues, which we're Mm -hmm. not going to dive into the plagues, but I've often heard it described as kind of a battle of the gods and Yahweh wins that battle. And as a result, the people are set free. Mm -hmm. So they're rescued from slavery. They've also been led in a really unique way by God. What does God use to lead them? A cloud and a pillar. It's almost like, I mean, I picture a little collar being put on us and leashes Mm -hmm. (laughs) lovingly taken for a walk in the direction that our God needs us to go. And it builds trust. It builds dependency. It builds a relationship. Yeah. And we see they're having to trust God to lead Mm -hmm. them. They don't know where they're going. Mm -hmm. And God is leading them. And then God rescues them from the Egyptian army, which comes and attacks them. And they're literally at the end of the road at the dead end at the Red Sea. And Mm -hmm. God rescues them. And so already the story of Exodus is kind of a reorienting to these people that haven't had their own identity in a long time. They've been under the influence of the Egyptian gods and the Egyptian leaders for a long time. So there's already this reorienting that the people are going through, that God is in control. Slavery is not their identity and purpose. God will provide for them and he's trustworthy is kind of where we're at in the story so far. And at the end of Exodus 15, they end up in this pretty amazing place called Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, Mm -hmm. and they camped there by the water. First of all, why would you ever leave that place? (laughs) That's the yeah. They had to walk through. They had to walk through a desert land, a well wilderness, to get to that place, right? Yeah. Yep. And they end up in a place with these 12 springs. 70 palm trees. And in the ancient world, you would have thought so much about water and food, right? Like Mm -hmm. so much of your day is about where am I going to get water and where am I going to get food? And here they are in this place of abundance. And then the people complain because they have all this water, but what do they not have? Food. Yeah. Food. And so what does God do? He miraculously provides food for them in what way? Comes in manna and eventually Mm -hmm. in quail. I think to myself too about, and tell me what you think of this, Daniel. Do they have kind of a built-in scarcity mentality that there's just never going to be enough? Well, I would imagine just being under the thumb of slavery. If there's Mm -hmm. one thing that seems pretty consistent in the different stories of slavery around the world is slave owners don't provide for their people. Mm. The role of a slave is to provide for the master, not the other way around. So they've literally lived Mm -hmm. under this yoke of slavery where it's not about caring for them. It's not about what's best for them. It's about them providing for Egypt. And so, yeah, I would imagine so. They're Mm -hmm. probably expecting, even though God's somewhat trustworthy, they're probably expecting God at any point to become like their slave masters, Mm -hmm. right? And take Mm -hmm. advantage of them. Unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's pick up the story there. This is chapter 16, verses 18, like kind of the end of verse 18 through the beginning of verse 20. They were given these instructions for the Sabbath of six days to gather. They must eat it all each day. And then on the sixth day, gather enough for the seventh. So they begin doing that. And then here's, here's kind of what happens. Those who gathered much had nothing left over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Again, after what we've talked about, why would they not listen to Moses? Well, they're used to not having enough, mm-hmm. right? Like they, they've mm-hmm. been slaves for a long time. And so as great as it sounds that God will provide for you tomorrow, Mm -hmm. there had to have been a sense in Mm -hmm. them that they're like, yeah, but I should just keep a little extra just in case. Totally. Just makes sense. It's just like wisdom, right? Yeah. It's the bird in the hand as opposed to the two birds in the bush. The bird in the hand is safe and secure. The two birds in the bush are a maybe. And they know how quickly food can disappear in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. They know how quickly they can go from having food to not having food. And so I think those are some very real reasons why it would be hard to trust Moses when he says, don't keep any till tomorrow. Now, some of them do. And what happens to that food? Yeah, what bad. Yeah. There's Eel. some worms <laughs> um, that show up. Yeah. So then on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food for the seventh day. 
This is picking up in verses 27 through 30 of Exodus 16. It says, On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given, I think that's a key word in this, given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you food for two days. Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Okay, so in the work they had to do to collect food during the week and then into the weekend, Mm -hmm. there were really two very different kinds of instructions given to them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because in the first five days, they're told just to collect enough for that day, and that's it. And if they kept it overnight, the next day it would all spoil and go bad. But then on the sixth day, they were invited to collect enough, not only for that day, but this miracle would happen that they could collect enough for the next day too, and that it wouldn't spoil. And that was how God kind of provided the opportunity for them to Shabbat or to rest, as we've kind of been talking about. Because they didn't have to go out work for the food, right? Yeah, exactly. So, they so could there's stay. trust both ways. There's trust in your daily and then trust yeah. when you rest. Yeah. And so in some ways you could say that Sabbath is about kind of rewiring <laughs> the brains of broken humans who are convinced that if they don't look out for themselves, then no one will. It's a practice for Israel of liberation from Egypt. And perhaps for us, if it does apply to us, which we haven't talked about yet, but it could be a liberation from the slavery of perfectionism or achievement or consumerism or all the ways that we talked Mm -hmm. about at the beginning, Mm -hmm. right? Of why it's so hard for us to rest. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, this is about as countercultural of a practice as you could get because it invites us to trust God and not ourselves. And so Israel was invited to trust God and not themselves. And I think we're invited to trust God and not ourselves. But of course, we'll have to wait to get to that until another conversation. Yeah, at the heart of this subject of rest and Sabbath is the issue of trust and trusting a God who loves us and provides for our good. And we're talking about Sabbath in this series of conversations called, Does Sabbath Still Matter? And so quick question for you. Do you like being told what to do? (laughs) My guess is no. We crave independence and autonomy, and we bristle at someone making the rules for us. Think about it. From the time we're little on, we participate in some form or another the same song and dance. We don't like someone telling us what to do. And so either we don't do it, or in a myriad of other ways, we act out. And rebelling against authority comes pretty naturally. Well, the next part of this conversation will come to probably the most familiar place in the Bible where Sabbath is mentioned, and that is in the Ten Commandments. Ooh, commandment. That sounds like we're being told what to do. We'll join Daniel and Elisa and Mart and Bill as they talk about command number four, the one about keeping the Sabbath when this episode of the Discover the Word podcast continues. Now, Discover the Word is part of Our Daily Bread Ministries, a Bible engagement ministry that in a number of ways seeks to fulfill our mission of making the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And so in addition to Discover the Word and, of course, the Our Daily Bread devotional, We also have what we call the Discovery Series. This is a library of fairly short, easy-to-read booklets and essays on topics pertinent to our faith and living life as a Christian that you can access when you go to discoveryseries.org. Our Daily Bread Ministries has created a space where you can read reliable Bible studies and commentaries from pastors and theologians to strengthen your faith. And there are a couple of resources about Sabbath that would be a good complement to this episode of the podcast that you can access if you'd like. When you go to the website, just type in Sabbath into the search bar or use the drop-down menu to start exploring all that's there. Discoveryseries.org offers more than 150 topical studies for learning more about God and His Word and how it applies to us today. So make it a point to visit Discovery Series. And now, the section of Scripture that has been a dominant factor in forming our understanding of Sabbath in the Ten Commandments, command number four, says, remember the Sabbath. And the fact that it's a commandment and how we generally respond to being told what to do. 
Well, that's where we pick up this part of our conversation called Does Sabbath Still Matter? Let's listen. Turn a few pages in your Bible to Exodus 20. And as you're turning there, what comes to your mind when you hear the word commandment? (laughs) Well, to me, it kind of depends on whether you're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, Jesus said, a new command I give to you that you love one another. Mm -hmm. And that feels very different than the ones you're pointing us to in Exodus chapter 20. Mm -hmm. But whenever you use the word command, I think it carries with it an authoritarian kind of emphasis Mm -hmm. that, I don't know, I even at this point, I pull back from it. Yeah, I totally agree with both of you. And it's like commandments, the Ten Commandments, if you will, are just heavy, impossible to keep measurements. And then Jesus comes on the scene and changes our whole understanding of it. But Jesus isn't on the scene in the Old Testament, yeah. or is he? You know, and I think we may mishear that word commandment a lot because Mm -hmm. we view it through ourselves rather than through the heart of God. Yeah, for me, when I hear that word, I feel my chest tighten a little bit, a little extra weight on my shoulders Uh, because so often commandments can feel like pressure to perform. I mean, even Bill, the one that you referenced, which thankfully Jesus nuances commandments a little bit for us, but even that one, it can feel like pressure to perform, right? Like I'm giving you this command, you need to love everybody. Right? And so it depends on the tone yeah, that you're hearing better, it from yeah, as to right. whether even that would be life-giving or not. And I think what we'll see here as we look through this particular command in the Ten Commandments, we'll see it's a pretty loving thing that God invites his people to, which is surprising. Because typically, again, when we think about commands, we think of something fun that we like is going to be banned or we can't do, (laughs) you know, whatever. We think of punishment. Yeah, we think about what comes after the command when we disobey Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. So in our last conversation, we actually saw the word command show up and it was before Israel had gotten to Mount Sinai and been handed this law, these contextualized pictures of God's justice in the world. It was kind of surprising to see it show up before we get to Mount Sinai. But what were some of the things that we kind of discovered about that command that God gave them to only gather on five days enough for the day and then on the sixth day enough for two days? Well, it was an invitation to trust God for their provision, especially on that seventh day, because Mm -hmm. on the other days, the food that they gathered, if they had some left over, it would spoil overnight, but they had to trust that on that one day, it wouldn't just because God said it wouldn't. Invitation to trust instead of toil, Mm -hmm. which is a word that shows up in the Bible a lot. It was also a gift, right? God said, I've given them the Sabbath. So there's this tone of giving being something that's good. It led to a break in work, versus more work. (laughs) So there's a lot of things that made it a really good thing for Israel, but we talked about how hard it is to trust God because we're so used to providing for ourselves, or trying Mm -hmm. to, at least. We talked about how hard it is to trust God in the daily, so to not store up manna and be in control, and then how hard it is to trust God in the rest because we're afraid that if we don't work, we won't have enough. We are just kind of wacky in our Mm -hmm. human condition. I think it's hooked into our survival instinct. I mean, we have that kind of hardwired into us that if we're going to survive, we're the ones who have to make that happen somehow. And we talked about how in this culture at this time, you would have thought a lot about where you're getting water and food, and you'd spend most of the energy of each day trying to find water and food because of... You know, there weren't grocery stores and things Mm -hmm. like that to provide. So as we continue in this conversation, just keep those other conversations in the backdrop as we look at probably the most famous passage on Sabbath would be my guess in the Bible. This is Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Mark, would you read that for us? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord has made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Yeah, so let's start with the end of that passage first. So what is this Sabbath day connected with historically? Creation. Yeah, and we talked about that a little bit Mm -hmm. in our very first conversation on the Sabbath because God Shabbated or he rested at the end (laughs) of his work. And so 
right here as Sabbath is moving from more of a verb of God Shabbating to a noun of a day, the Sabbath day, we see that it's connected with the rhythm of God creating the world. And remember why God rested. Was he tired and exhausted? What was going on there? We talked about how he paused. He delighted in what he had done. It was fulfilled. It was finished. And he stopped. He ceased creating Mm. and delighted or appreciated it. And so Mm. maybe consider this question as we keep going. If Shabbating was good enough for God, should it be good enough for us too, right? So God who has no limits took a break. It feels safe to suggest that perhaps humans that have lots of limits (laughs) should take a break at times. And so let's keep digging in as we go through the rest of this passage. If we go back to the top, what is the first word there? Remember. Remember. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you think they're being asked to remember? I could say a lot of things, but I think just from following our conversation where you've been leading us, Daniel, I think it's remember your dependency on God. Remember God's provision for you. Remember his love for you. Yeah. And the words here are just remember the Sabbath day. But that word remember is used throughout the Bible and often it ties back to the liberation from Egypt, the Exodus. And so I think there's a sense here in which there's more than just remember this one day. It's like, remember everything that also comes with this day. Remember creation where God rested. Remember your liberation from Egypt. And so there's like this sense in which there's a remembering that happens as a part of Sabbath. I think that's really important. It's a recalling of the goodness of God, of his generosity, of all of the good things that he's given you and placed in your hand, that keeps it from being a simple ought or should. It also makes me wonder about, you know, we're talking about Shabbating versus the Shabbat, the resting versus a day of the week. Is there a a pause within our week, an intentional way in which we remember? You know, so remember Mm -hmm. the Sabbath, stop long enough, pause long enough to remember. It's an intentionality there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and pause long enough, not just to remember what God has done or whatever. But again, in our first conversation, we talked about there's a delight in that. So it's it's a pausing to not only remember, but to delight in what God has done and what we have been able to be a part of that week of things like that, perhaps. I wonder also, does this kind of imply that it would be really easy to forget the Sabbath, <laughs> right? So if, if God's giving this loving command to remember the Sabbath day, does that mean that our default as humans would be to forget the Sabbath day? Mm. I think we've talked Mm. about that in a different sense, just by talking about how hard it is for us to trust him. Yeah, Mm -hmm. It's much easier to forget than it is to trust. Yeah. Now this next phrase is interesting. So remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We've talked a little bit about God hallowed the seventh day and made it holy. So What do you think's going on here? What does this mean here that we would keep this Sabbath day holy? Well, the word holy means to have something set apart Mm -hmm. and distinct, usually set apart and distinct for God's use. Yeah, and set apart is special, right? Mm -hmm. We've already seen in both of our first conversations, six days of this rhythm and then a break in that rhythm. And this seventh day is special and set apart as special in some way. So at the beginning of the world, that was God Shabbating, God resting and delighting in his creation. In Exodus 16, it was the people being invited not to toil, but to trust God with the food that he provided the day before. And so perhaps that's part of this too, is it's just leave this day as special. It's going to be so easy to try to make it not special and pull it into the rhythm of all the other days. Mm -hmm. Uh, Remember it keep it holy, leave it as something that's special, which, Bill, to your point, would draw us closer toward God because of the required trust that that Mm -hmm. puts in us toward God. Have you ever noticed that the Jewish people that you've known over the years who keep Shabbat do consider it with a certain delight? Yeah, absolutely. It's family time. It's, It's a positive thing for them, whereas I think for many of us Gentiles, it just takes a whole different tone. Yeah. When I was pastoring, my secretary told me that when she was a little girl, her parents were very strict on the Sabbath day and honoring it. And I said, well, what did that look like? And she said, well, it meant that on the Sabbath day, I could color because that was playing, but I couldn't use scissors because that was work. Mm. I mean, that sounds kind of like the drudgery kind of thing that you're describing, Mart, as opposed to delight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that brings us to the next part 
of this series of verses, it says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day you should not do any work. Now, how is work defined here? It's not. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> right. That's right. But then this whole group of people is included. You, mm-hmm. your children, your male or female slave, your livestock, an alien resident in your town, this whole group of people is included. Mm-hmm. So in this one section, though, it's not defined what work is, but where all these people are mentioned. Are there any particular groups of people that jump out to you in that list, Elisa? Well, the people like slaves or servants, mm-hmm. they're there to work. So that catches me. It's very different from what they experienced in Egypt, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. You talked, Daniel, about the fact that when they were slaves in Egypt, They were there to provide for their masters, not to be cared for. Mm -hmm. But here there's a provision that even the servants are to be cared for. Yeah, and even the animals, the beasts of birth, were not to work. yeah. Yeah, that one really surprised me. But then I was also thinking about, well, an animal working in ancient times typically has someone who's driving that animal in the field, right? right? And so mm-hmm. maybe God's closing one of the loopholes here that he knew they would try, <laughs> which is like, well, no, I'm not, I'm not working. It's the livestock that's working. He's like, yeah, but you're the one walking with the livestock. So let's just take a break altogether, right? I think God cared for the animals. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Too. Really yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. And as a result, even the fields get rest as well. Mm-hmm. And that's not mentioned in mm-hmm. here, but because of all of these other people are taking a break, even creation itself, you could say, gets to experience rest gets to experience Mm -hmm. a break. Mm -hmm. And I think all of this ties back to remember, right? Especially as it refers to Elisa, as you pointed out, male and female slaves, because typically that would be the place for abuse or exploitation, right? I'm not going to give them a day off. So I can have this day off and I can take a day without worrying about anything because I've got all these people working for me. And yet that was, even that was built into the keeping of the Sabbath day holy. One other group that's mentioned is not only kids, but aliens in your town. I mean, it depends on your translation. I don't think that means extraterrestrials, but maybe uh, maybe yeah. it does. Um, <laughs> no, uh, but one of the things that, as we've talked about, like justice and righteousness and stuff like that in the Old Testament is God cares very much about the most vulnerable and caring for the most vulnerable. And so the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. And so even that is tied into this of look out for those who are in your midst that aren't a part of the community in the same way and care about them Mm -hmm. too. So as we think about all of that together, does that feel like this, like God putting his thumb down with this command to force you to do something? Or what's kind of the sense that you get as we think about all these different elements to this command about what God's doing here? I think of a couple of things. One is that we tend to think of commandments as heaviness put down on us to obey or else. And when we reconfigure it and really look at the heart of our God who offers these instructions, all the commands are gifts to help us see how to live life God's way. God's way is for our good. So that's one thing that's really striking me is that his commands are all gifts. Yeah, Yeah, and I think it, it goes back to one of the things that you mentioned as you were describing commands, Elisa, is we often think of commands as putting pressure on us. But the very heart behind this command is to relieve pressure. And that's what makes it such Mm -hmm. a loving command. And so as we continue to walk through this idea of Sabbath in the Bible, just keep that in the back of your mind, that even the heart behind this Sabbath is God's love. It's a gift that he wants to give to his kids. And I think as we get into the New Testament, we'll see that pretty clearly. What is an example of a time in life where the desire to get things right actually causes hurt or pain to others? My mind immediately goes to when I was pastoring, and I don't remember what the theme of the message was. I just remember that it was a very strong message on living out the scriptures in a certain way. And this very wise woman in the church came to me afterwards and said, why is it so important that we always have to be right? Mm -hmm. And I just looked at her and said, as opposed to being wrong, I mean, but she was going for what you're saying. She wasn't saying we should try to be wrong. She was saying is we need to be careful how we are right, because if we're right in the wrong way, it can hurt others. Yeah, you know, I remember my wife, Diane, really brought me up short. It happened decades ago, but we were trying in our work and in our ministry together to wrestle through some very difficult social and moral issues. And we were trying to find a biblical text to prove our point. <laughs> and I remember Diane just kind of, she 
came to the end of her patience and she said, why isn't love enough? Mm. Why isn't caring for people enough to resolve this? Well, I look back on it, she was absolutely right. right. Mm. It's not a, a biblical issue of whether the command means this. Is our heart full of the yeah. same kind of love that's been shown to us mm. by our God? Yeah, and I think that's what my friend was driving for that Sunday morning after church as well. We've kind of landed on it in a number of areas of the ministry where we try to drive ourselves to ask the question, what does love require? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to what does law require or what mm -hmm. does creedal observance require or what does liturgy require? What does love mm -hmm. require? Mm -hmm. And that's really a good place to land when you're dealing mm -hmm. with some of those murky issues. It really is. Yeah. So good. And you mentioned liturgy, Bill. One of the painful memories for me was a, as a pastor being in a situation where we were having a family emergency. And while I'm waiting at the hospital <laughs> with my mom, my text messages are blowing up because the church is trying to make sure they do something right. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in the conversation was there like, hey, Daniel, how are you doing? Like, are you okay? Oh, yeah. Or anything like that. So it was so much about making sure the service was right in a liturgical sense that I actually, it, it was really hurtful in that moment. Yeah. Daniel, what I relate to is a principle that, had to be pointed out to me <laughs> is that you know people are more important than things and people are more important than tasks and i'm a task oriented person i love checklists i love checking things off i do want to do things right mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure i pay attention but you're right when we elevate doing something right like a task over a person and the relationship we miss the whole point of in the end, what does love require? Yeah. And then when we start talking about the world of beliefs and God and trying to get things right in that sense, mm -hmm. there feels like a whole extra weight. It's like right. judgy stuff starts happening. Yeah. And so, you know, I can think of times where political perspectives, people are sharing what they think is right, but they do it in such an unloving way or an attacking way that it causes pain or a rift in a relationship. Yeah, it turns social media into anti-social media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or when we try to defend the Bible and Christianity. Sometimes we don't do that in a very loving, kind way. It's so much about being right that we forget exactly what you described, Elisa, of caring for the person. And I think we'll see that really clearly in this next passage as we continue talking about Sabbath or God Shabbating and perhaps uh, is there an invitation for us in this as well. So let's turn into the New Testament, Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. Headings aren't always helpful in the Bible, but sometimes they can be really helpful. And this heading in my Bible says a pronouncement about the Sabbath. So that should be helpful for us as we're considering <laughs> if it still matters. So let's read that. And again, remember, we've talked about Sabbath as a loving gift. It's Sabbath is resting. Sabbath is trust and provision and blessing. I think what we're going to see in this passage is perhaps people trying so hard to do it right that they've lost sight of God's heart behind what the Sabbath is. So let's, mm -hmm. let's look for that as we read. So Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. Elisa, will you read that for us? One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Quick pause. Who's he? Oh, that would be Jesus. Thanks. Yeah. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he, Jesus, said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. After our last conversation, we need to ask a question before we can dive into this too deeply. So the Pharisees look at him and say, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? They're walking through this field, picking grain. How did the Ten Commandments itself define not working? It didn't. So they're defining this somewhere else outside of the Ten yeah. Commandments. It could be in Exodus thirty-four twenty-one. It says, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even in plowing time and in harvest time, you shall rest. So perhaps mm -hmm. they're starting to extrapolate on that a little bit like, oh, well, if we're supposed to rest in harvest time and technically Jesus and his disciples are harvesting, 
maybe. But there's also this collection of ideas called the Talmud. And Bill, you, Mara, Lisa have been studying this way longer than I have. What is the, the Talmud? They're writings by the rabbis. Yeah, and it was an application, mm-hmm. interpretation, yeah, Lisa, of the Old Testament law so that Jewish people knew what they were responsible to live out. In a way, it's like our commentaries that Mm -hmm. we use to help us understand scripture. Um, The difference between commentaries and the Talmud is that the Talmud was held in a much higher regard by the Jewish people. And in some ways, it was elevated almost to the level of the law itself, where Mm. I don't think any of us would take a commentary and elevate it to the level of the scripture. And also, Bill, it was a huge body of tradition. Yeah. It wasn't just a simple book, even. And many of those applications were tied to everyday life circumstances, where the law didn't specifically speak to what do you do when you're walking through a grain field on the Sabbath, right? And so the, the Talmud would begin to explain, okay, this is what some of the expectations are. At this point, the Jews took Sabbath so seriously that some of them refused to even fight on the Sabbath during the Maccabean revolt in 168 Mm. BC to the extent that they lost their lives because they were in the middle of battles and they would not fight because of this tradition of what it means to honor the Sabbath. I wonder too, if you could even go back so far as before the law. Mm. Remember there was the law of the Sabbath when it came to collection of, of manna. Yeah. You know, they were not to collect their food mm-hmm. even before Moses, you know, was given the law. Yep. Mm-hmm. What I was wondering, and this maybe goes back to the issue we started off talking about, trying to get things right, that it actually causes hurt. I find it interesting that the Pharisees go to, you're violating the law. They don't go to the, you're stealing this person's grain. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the Talmud included restrictions on travel and preparing food. And so you could say that Jesus' disciples were violating those as well because they were both traveling by walking through the field and they were preparing it by rubbing the husks in their hands and then eating. So then Jesus responds to them by telling a short story about David. It's just this story that I think kind of illustrates that there's a spirit of the law and also a letter of the law. And David was given grace to break the letter of the law and eat the bread of the presence, which is an interesting response. But then where this story goes next, I think is really telling. What happens immediately after this section? Jesus goes to the synagogue in Mark 3, and there's a man there with a withered Mm -hmm. hand. And it's a Sabbath day, but Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath day. And then what is the immediate response of the Pharisees? Oh, they're mad again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says that they start collaborating with the Herodians about how to destroy Jesus, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. that's how big of a deal that Sabbath would be to them is, and we kind of referenced this early on, Jesus... In some ways, you could say he died because of the Sabbath and keeping it differently than they would keep it. We use a term sometimes when we're talking about interpreting the Bible, the interpretive key of a passage. And it means like this phrase or this idea kind of helps unlock the story. And I feel like the interpretive key in this story, perhaps, and I'd love to just throw this out and you all respond. Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for humankind not humankind for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So especially in light of our whole conversation that we've had so far on Sabbath, where do you kind of see that in the story of the Bible as it relates to Sabbath? Well, I think we've talked about how God's intent in Shabbating, resting himself, was to delight and bless the completed work. And then we looked at how he really gave the Israelites an opportunity to depend upon him on a daily basis for manna and then depend upon him in a time of rest on the Sabbath. So all of this reveals this heart that is toward our good. It looks to me like from the explanations of the Talmud and the way these particular religious leaders, Pharisees were interacting, they had taken what was meant to be good and twisted it Mm -hmm. into something heavy, impossible, and that which would give death more than life if you can't even eat or heal Mm -hmm. on a given day. How is that what love requires? Yeah, Yeah. the law had become more important than people. Yeah, and I think you commented several times in our conversations, Daniel, that Sabbath was intended by God as a gift. Mm -hmm. And as a gift, it was intended to relieve stress and relieve burden and relieve struggle. But because of the Talmudic writings and the interpretations of the rabbis and how they said it had to be observed, it became just the opposite. 
mm-hmm. rather than being something that relieved stress, it just intensified it, which mm-hmm. may speak to why Jesus at one point said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you bind heavy burdens on the people's back, but you won't even lift a finger to help them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we can yeah. definitely see that in this story. So God created the Sabbath as a gift, and he commanded it for the good of the world and for our good. But when the practice of keeping the Sabbath or any law or theology or perspective or whatever, as we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, gets in the way of loving others, we are missing out on the heart and the intention of why God institutes things like Sabbath. It's for good, not for harm. Yeah, that's an important piece of our conversation in this episode and a great reminder about the true importance of Sabbath. Well, one more 12 minute segment of this conversation left. And uh, do you mind if I ask how much sleep you would say you get each night? Uh, research seems to indicate that adults need to average seven to eight hours of slumber every day for peak health benefits. Our bodies need a regular rhythm of rest. That's how God made us. Uh, Not enough isn't good for us, and too much really isn't good for us either. But, you know, even though we know that, do you struggle to get the right amount of rest? Of course, there can be a lot of factors involved, but uh, we so often think we can cheat the system and get away with ignoring something that we obviously need, and that is rest. Well, this edition of the Discover the Word podcast has been about the biblical idea of Sabbath, asking the question, does Sabbath still matter? And we will close this conversation by talking about rest and how Sabbath fits into this God-given need for us to rest. We'll do that right after we take a moment to look ahead to our next study together. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, our friend, biblical scholar Randy Richards joins us again. This time to talk about how understanding what writing letters was like back in the ancient world, how that can help us understand Paul, the letter writer. Most of us imagine Paul writing like our grandfather would have written a letter. Hmm. You sit down at a desk, now we give him a candle, and we give him (laughs) papyrus and a pen, and we Mm -hmm. imagine he sat down uh, one quiet evening, started writing to the Mm -hmm. Romans. When he finished, he signed it, rolled it up, handed it to somebody to mail off. And what I like to say is pretty much everything about that image is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what was it like? And how does understanding the process help us with these important sections of the New Testament? Well, Randy has done extensive research in this area, and we will learn a lot about Paul, the letter writer, in a two-part episode with Randy Richards next time here on Discover the Word. And now the conclusion of this episode's focus on the question, does Sabbath still matter? What are different ways that we use the word rest? And now you know the rest of the story. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) That's good. Uh I think about restroom, rest stop. Mm-hmm. rest home, or even, this is really different, rest in music yeah, is an actual, you, ah. you know, a punctuation in music kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's good. Mart, any ideas? No, just the, we use it as eat the rest of your food, you know, yeah, <laughs> throw, throw the rest of it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We will rest something on a counter or a table. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we mm-hmm. talk about the armrest of a Mm-hmm. Of a chair. Yep. What does it mean when a coach says, take a rest? Eat. It probably means you've not been doing real well and he <laughs> wants to get you out of there. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll tell kids to go rest, to go take a nap, mm-hmm. take a break. Yeah. Grouchy. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. And then have you ever heard it used eternal rest? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes you even see that inscribed on tombstones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot of different ways that we use that little four-letter word, rest. Mm-hmm. And for some of us, rest is a four-letter word, <laughs> meaning we don't like it and we don't want to do yeah. it, And which we kind of started off the whole series talking about that. <laughs> As we finish up our series on Sabbath, we're going to read a passage that uses the idea of Sabbath rest in a little bit different of a way. And I think this is going to kind of help tie up our whole conversation together. 
This is in Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 9 through 11. And I'll just admit, Hebrews is a confusing book for me. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And even, mm-hmm. even digging into this passage, it was like, man, there's a lot of different ideas moving around and things yeah. like that. But let's work through it together and see what we could find. So Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Bill, will you read that for us? So then a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. That's interesting. Mm. So that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. It's interesting that he wants us to work at entering the rest. Isn't that? that um, I noticed that too. It's kind of a weird passage in some ways, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So right before this passage, we see these reminders of the destructive consequences of not following God's way to true life or flourishing as humans. In fact, in chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, it re tells the story from the Old Testament of many of the Israelites not entering the rest that God had prepared for them, meaning the promised land. They literally refused to enter, if you remember that story. So they were ready to go. They sent in these spies into the land. The spies came back and said, we don't want to do this because, well, most of the spies said, we don't want to do this because the people are giants and this is going to be really hard and maybe a lot of us will die and stuff like that. And so as a result, Israel literally refused to enter the promised land. That's part of the context Mm. that's here. To Bill, your point of mentioning that make every effort to enter God's rest, I think there's like a warning right here that God's rest is available to you, but don't be like Israel who didn't enter it. But then there's also like a, a little reminder in here of why the Sabbath exists Altogether, And that's in chapter four, verses four through five. Elisa, would you read that for us? For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. And what is that one place we talked about in our very first conversation where it talked about God resting on the seventh day. It goes way back to the beginning, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, where we talked about God did all of this really good work, and then he pauses at the end of that work to delight and to rest and to enjoy what he has made. So now we get to this passage. So that's the context leading up to this passage. So maybe because of how many details there are in there, let's just read that again. So, Mark, maybe you could read Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 11 again, and that's where we're going to kind of dig in for the rest of the conversation. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their own works, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Yeah. So, Bill, you already mentioned something that jumped out to you in this passage. What jumps out, Elisa, to you or to Mark? No one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So, I mean, we just talked about earlier that rest can be seen in an eternal sense of a hereafter with God. Is he actually saying that you're going to forego that if you refused an earthly rest? I don't know if this helps any, Elisa, but my translation says, lest anyone fall through Mm. following the same example of disobedience. So miss out on something that's valuable. Okay. And that's what happened to Israel, right? When they decided Mm -hmm. they weren't going in, they missed out on Mm -hmm. 40, I think it's 40 years, right? Of being in the promised land earlier, if they had decided to walk with God at that moment into the promised land. And so they did. So it's really a, not a disobedience so much as well that could be, but it's really a missing out on God's presence now, missing mm-hmm. out on his provision, not trusting him. Yeah, the work that God wants to do for us, mm-hmm. but we're so inclined to do it our own way mm-hmm. that we resist that, waiting on him, trusting him. And oftentimes we define sin in all these really complicated ways. But throughout the New Testament, sin is just referred to as missing the mark, like Mm. missing the opportunity to follow God, missing the opportunity to trust him, of seeing God going this way and deciding not to go that way with God. Uh, And so even that, there's kind of a sense of that here too, I think. So what jumps out to me in this is, first of all, I think this is an indication that we need to be careful if we say Sabbath doesn't apply to us today. 
because this is in Hebrews, right? And so this is after Jesus has come, he's risen, he's gone to sit on the throne of heaven. And here in Hebrews, we have this invitation to experience God's rest. And not only is it an invitation, but it's like a, let's make every effort to enter this rest, right? So there's like an urgency here. And that makes me wonder, is this a rest that we can experience right now? Or is this a rest for some other time? What do you think? I think it's both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's both in the fact that, as we've talked about so much in, in these conversations, on the one hand, the rest that we experience now is a rest that teaches us trust and dependence. But the rest that is the eternal rest is what awaits us at the end of our journey. And what's the promise that Jesus gives in mm-hmm. Matthew eleven twenty eight? Yeah, that's what I keep thinking about, Daniel, because yeah. that is so current and real time. I mean, certainly it was real to the the people Jesus spoke to, but oh my goodness, to us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And he goes on, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Mm -hmm. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I hear echoes of what we talked about, about the commandments as being heavy and burdensome and impossible instead of being a gift as God intended. And, you know, Jesus really intends for to walk with him, yoked with him, where we trust him as we go in his ways and he provides for us as we yield our control to him. That's a very current, present rest. Mm -hmm. And isn't it helpful too to think about the way that Jesus, he didn't spend his time worrying what other people thought of him, but it was all about what the Father Mm -hmm. wanted him to do. And he was relying on the works of the Father to follow him. So it's, I think he gives us a wonderful example, even in his own reliance and waiting on the Father. Yeah, absolutely. And the times that he would disappear to pray for a while and you could say to rest in God Mm -hmm. in between all the many activities and all the different healings and all the miracles and provisions and all that that Jesus did, he often went to a quiet place to rest in God, to spend time with God. Mm -hmm. So that's the immediate rest. But I think this Hebrews passage kind of hints toward maybe rest being something that's long-term as well. And so I want to jump to one more passage where we're going to see the word rest show up. This is Revelation 14, verses 12 through 13. Mart, would you read that for us? This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. So we saw this immediate rest that Jesus invites us into. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. But there's a a long-term rest, too, that God's offering as well. And that's really what I think kind of ties this whole story of Shabbat or Sabbath together throughout the whole Bible. It starts with God creating a very good world and then resting and delighting in that world. And then the story ends with God inviting all of creation back into his presence to rest and delight with him, which I think is a pretty amazing idea. So as we think about Sabbath and whether it applies to us or not, what do you think? Yes. And yes, (laughs) I think it does. You know, I think there's a, I've used this phrase before, there's both a posture of dependency on God in our daily, and there's also a pause, you know, an opportunity to take specific time to take off. And haven't you noticed too that in those moments when we do wait on the Lord and just really rely on him to accomplish something, when you look back and you say, the Lord did that. The Lord did Mm -hmm. something that I couldn't have done or even thought of doing on my own. And there's great joy in, in resting in that awareness. So Sabbath was initiated at the beginning of the world when God took time to Shabbat, to rest, to delight in his new creation. Then, as we saw, became a sign of liberation of Israel from slavery in Egypt and became a central part of the community life of Israel. And as a result, it was very countercultural because it invited every person, regardless of status or caste, even the creatures and animals, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and even the land to rest and to trust God as the provider. It was also a loving command, as we talked about, from God to discover that he knows what's best and 
the Sabbath became a healing gift in the hands of Jesus. And finally, Sabbath is not only an invitation for today to find rest in God, but also becomes a picture of that peaceful shalom or peaceful rest that God has in store for all who look to him. So the question I'd like to just leave us all with, and we're not going to answer this, but just carry this into our upcoming weeks. How can we lean into the practice of, of Sabbath? What would it look like to be a Shabbating or a Sabbath people in a world that especially pushes the opposite direction? Perhaps it's simply to hear Jesus' words, which I'd like to kind of end with again. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yeah, rest in the many ways the idea shows up in Scripture and in life is so important. Our question this week has been, does Sabbath still matter? And I think we're coming away with a resounding yes. It is a principle, a rhythm that God modeled and gave to us that is for our good. And uh, just after we close this conversation, I love the way Daniel breathed just a short prayer for us that I think expresses our hope for this study. Friends, may we learn to enter that rest today and forever. Amen. In so many ways, Sabbath and rest matter. Daniel Ryan Day, Elisa Morgan, Mark DeHaan, and Bill Crowder are on the table with you for another helpful hour of studying the Bible together on Discover the Word. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we walk with you through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And of course, at Our Daily Bread Ministries and Discover the Word, we want to help you draw closer to God and experience some of that rest that the team talked about. That's why we make this podcast and so many other resources available that point you to the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible. But we couldn't do that without you. And so thank you for supporting us with your donations. They really do make a difference. To partner with us financially and give, simply go to discovertheword.org, click Donate, and explore some options and see how you can give right there. All right, well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.